Welcome to the Voice of Counseling, presented by the American Counseling Association. This program is hosted by Dr. S. Kent Butler. This week's episode is technology, telehealth, and professional practice, and features Dr. John Duggan. Welcome to the Voice of Counseling from the American Counseling Association. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and joining us today is Dr. John Duggan. John is a practitioner, educator, and he's ACA's staff lead on developing multimedia educational experiences for our profession. Today, we're gonna to be exploring technology, telehealth, and professional practice. In this conversation, we'll learn about practical use of technology and get some helpful tips on the use of telehealth as the landscape changes in the era of the COVID pandemic. So Dr. Duggan is an ideal practitioner and he's going to share his insight on these particular issues. Welcome to the conversation. How are you doing, Dr. Duggan? Dr. Butler, good morning, good day. It's good to be with you. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you, Kent. Good to be with you as well. And look at that that bright smile you have on your face. Where was that <laughs> eight minutes ago? I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. We've been on there waiting to start this podcast. So I hope all is well. So how, it, how it have is. You been? I mean, how, we get a little been? bit of rain up here in DC, but it's oh, uh, it's okay. kind of kind of fall, you know. So yeah, that's good. what it is. That's what it is. Well, that's where you chose to live. So I don't know. Yeah. Um, so how how has uh, life been for you as you've been dealing with the last two years of this um, COVID pandemic? It has been, um, so I'm good. Uh, I, I'm grateful to be healthy and, um, you know, doing things to take care. Um, it has been um, very difficult also in that, um, you know, there, there's just been a lot of um, hurt and angst. I mean, we have multiple pandemics that are going on. I have, uh, you know, I'm involved in education and working and uh, school counseling and clinical mental health counseling education and working to focus on anti-racism and uh, helping practitioners understand uh, the xenophobia, the xenonegativity, trans negativity. There's just been so much you've been exploring in these podcasts that has been kind of weighing on uh, on me and on us, uh, my family here. Um, and and also just kind of, you know, taking it in, it's just like um, 20, almost 23 months of um, staying very close to home um, and uh, seeing family once over uh, over that period of time. It's, uh, it's been an adjustment, but, um, what it reminds me of, and this comes into one of our first questions, is the wisdom that has helped me get through uh, the first part of the pandemic, and we, we can we can lean into that. But you know, I, I'm doing okay given what it is. How are you? How are, how are things going for you? I'm leaning in. Um, I'm doing what I can to kind of stay. Um, you know, to be honest, I, I've said I said this a couple of times. I am definitely an introvert. And so the pandemic hasn't messed with me the way that it has messed with individuals who like to be out there, out and about. I've, I've been able to maintain and stay kind of relatively calm and, and, and buy um, into what's happening in my life. Uh, just being close to family here, uh, FaceTime and Zoom has been helpful. It has, I, I'll be honest about that. I'm glad we're gonna talk a little bit about what this might look like from a telehealth type situation, but it's been really a, um, a, been a long time. You know, I think I'm ready to get out. I would love for this uh, pandemic to be over. Uh, I, I don't think anybody wishes it more than I do at this point in time, but I'm going to make do. When I'm out and about though, I'm masked up and taking care of my health. And so um, that's kind of where I am right now. And so it's, it's been an interesting ride and I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. So when you talk, when you think about telehealth and all the things that are going on in our community as a council, um, what are some of the, the things that like stand out to you? What, what do you think off the bat 
we as counselors need to know about how we can kind of maintain and do the work that we do um, in this telehealth environment? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think one of the important things for us to consider, and this goes for uh, our students, new professionals, as well as the advanced practitioners, so across the spectrum, is that this is a changing landscape. And it has not, using technology, using telehealth in general, has, has not settled, if you will. And I personally would recommend using a legal ethical decision-making model to, to really think about when it is appropriate to uh, engage in uh, telehealth and what types of practices uh, that, that we're doing, because it's it's not as easy as just going based on licensure and, and, and those things. I think there are other issues that you know we could talk about, but the, the landscape is changing. Clearly the pandemics uh, that we're experiencing, and I'm using that plurally because there are just multiple needs that are going on. Uh, we're looking at hospitals that have been closing for decades, uh, parts of the country where there are no healthcare practitioners, um, and you know, folks are needing the support. We're looking at interventions within the school systems and having clinicians that are supporting school counselors and uh, finding ways to, you know, to, to help the various needs that are going on. And a lot of that is going to, I think, come from technology. And what we've learned through the pandemic is that um, there are just so many opportunities that I think folks were holding back on. Uh, in, in terms of you know the approval process, and so um, that that's going to I think continue to expand. Our struggle is um, as a profession we often come from schools of education, and so over the you know the years, and soon you'll uh, you know have another interview on um, looking at Medicare and things like that with some other uh, other folks from ACA, but we really need to also look at ourselves as healthcare practitioners. And with that comes all of the other stuff that applies to you know, physicians, dentists, and, and so on. And so I think it's important for us to kind of take these different variables and bring them together and find a way to make it a meaningful intervention, a meaningful use of technology and engage in it ethically. And remember that we are also healthcare practitioners who uh, need to, you know, need to kind of step into it from, from that perspective. So how do you wrap your head around that though as a healthcare professional? Um, you know that you have a job to do, but how do you come to grips with all of this? Sure, well, I, I think, um, one of the the important pieces is you know becoming knowledgeable about uh, the technologies that are available, uh, paying attention to our our standard of care, which is the uh, 2014 ACA Code of Ethics, and and how it is that we would normally protect uh, you know client student privacy and confidentiality uh, in. The, the physical setting, right? And, and then think about how we then expand that into uh, the settings where we're using technology. One of the, the things that I think is going to be important for our profession, and it's, it's evolving, is that, you know, Kent, there are 30 plus names for uh, the use of telehealth and technology that are out there in the literature. I mean, so 35 or 40 names. Our code of ethics, when it was written, was calling it distance counseling. And other practitioners and I have, you know, clearly had the experience where we're having groups and people are using technology to securely send us messages in the group setting, in the same physical space. And what that means is that there is no distance. We're, we've been physically present before the pandemic. And people are, you know, especially, you know, teens and young adults, they're sending that stuff through an encrypted uh, telehealth type platform, um, although it's mostly messaging. And what we really need to remember is that it is no longer just about distance. It's about the use of technology. Um, and then that's one of the things we're 
where I, I really enjoyed the uh, the book that we we have uh, from ACA. It's talking about using of technology assisted distance supervision, um, and, and so remembering that this is about the use of technology. Um, how I wrap my head around it, though, is that we need to continually be uh, seeking and engaging supervision and training. Uh, our supervisors need to be trained in the intervention of using technology uh, and, and telehealth services and, and really getting some different types of feedback in terms of what is working and what doesn't, and also being attentive to who's appropriate. Now, I understand that in the pandemic, right, um, we don't have much of a choice. So I, I get that. So I, I don't want folks to kind of hear this and go, what the heck is this guy saying? But over the years of clinical practice, I've worked with um, folks from different diverse social identities and backgrounds, uh, some who did not have uh, bank accounts, let alone able to have um, you know, technology and internet service, um, as well as folks who have um, you know, bipolar spectrum, psychotic disorders. I became a specialist with dissociative identity disorders and uh, people who had adverse childhood experiences or who actually were, um, you know, kind of asylees to the United States and had experienced um, periods of torture. And so for some of those individuals, using telehealth services, audio and video, can be helpful for them to remember who John is as a counselor, uh, because someone who has that type of an experience can, after a couple of weeks, forget who you or I are, uh, that that sense of identity can, can kind of fade away. And, and, but we have to make sure that the person is uh, appropriate and is going to be uh, well served through the use of technology. So my hope is that as we look at the use, we just don't have a kind of one size fits all mm. approach right. as the pandemic recedes. So can you talk a little bit about it from the ethical point of view then? Because that sounds like it feeds right into how counselors can stay above the grade, right? And make sure that they are not doing harm, especially from an ethical point of view. Exactly. And so we, we need to pay attention to really our, our use of an assessment. Um, part of it also, is, as you had asked earlier, was um, you need to also look at your scope of practice and your licensure uh, uh, regulation. So, for example, I'm here in Maryland. There are very specific things that uh, need to happen in order for a counseling relationship to begin. And so there needs to be a thorough assessment. There needs to be certain things in the documentation and, and all of that. Um, ethically, we need to make sure that we're doing that. And so there are some uh, services or platforms uh, that will allow one to initiate a telehealth. I call it kind of like a, a counselor on retainer type thing where you know the counselor is, is into this, this service they're getting paid a certain amount, they get certain clients, and there may not be uh, really the ability to do a visual and a thorough assessment to determine, well, is John experiencing bereavement, or is it a depression, or is it a thyroid disorder, or is it sleep apnea? What's going on? I mean, somebody can can initially say, hey, I took this assessment online and I think I have depression. It's just, it's, you know, this is what it is. Well, okay, but we need to engage ethically in a thorough assessment. We need to ethically do interdisciplinary care. And remember that when we're looking from the clinical side of things, the diagnostic processes you do a rule out for any type of substance, any type of environmental factor that may be influencing, right? Um, I've had times where I've worked with clients who um, are, are referred to me for panic disorder and the panic comes when they're putting their head down to sleep on the pillow. And so the assumption can be, oh my gosh, there's panic because of something that's related to um, you know, where they're sleeping. Well, 
when you're following the rule out process of first looking at the environment and the substance, uh, any substances, uh, and that could be over the counter medication too. And then looking at the medical issues, getting a full diagnostic from a physician to rule out any organic or metabolic issues. Then you can start to figure out, well, okay, what else is going on? How am I ethically engaging in counseling with this particular person? Kent, in the scenario that I just laid out for you, one particular client who maybe is having uh, panic when they're uh, kind of going to sleep, it actually turns out to an allergy. That is a very, you know, there are still issues that can be worked out in the counseling relationship, and those can be addressed in telehealth. Mm -hmm. But the key factor that I want to point out is ethically, we need to make sure that we're following all of the steps that are part of the standard of care. Um, and I'll add, not just doing evidence-based interventions for the sake of doing an evidence-based intervention, right? So how do you ensure that you're doing the right thing um, for your clients? Because it, it, this is a, a, a big mixed bag of a whole lot of things that are coming together that we have to sort through in order to ensure that we are doing the right thing. So, you know, you, you're talking about these assessments. Can you talk a little bit about how that's different than if you are face to face with a client? And and also what what do we need to know as counselors that help us to kind of take that into consideration? And because how does that look different? Sure. I, I, I think so this is anecdotally uh, from my experience, it takes uh, much more time and it, it takes patience because sometimes maybe things that folks might have been familiar to do on a, you know, a paper uh, or in, in an office setting uh, while they're waiting, um, they may forget to do if you have an online assessment. So one, one type of, of way of approaching it is um, you know, a screening instrument where you're tracking not necessarily a diagnostic exam, so it's not an advanced appraisal, but you're having some sort of a service that's set up and uh, sometimes they can be reimbursable if, if a counselor is billing health insurance, uh, submitting claims, and you can track symptoms. You can rule out, um, you know, if there is any report, and this is self-report of uh, something that is related to misuse of a, a substance or if there are markers for PTSD. But I think also at the same time when we're going through these instruments and being patient because it's not as easy as doing it in the, the office setting, sometimes people are going to need help uh, to navigate these, these items. Uh, to also then make sure that you have a good physician or three that are uh, kind of in your, 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 your field, your, you know, you're on your team, and you can make those referrals uh, so that somebody is also getting um, a good quality medical checkup uh, along the way. And, you know, it's really helpful when the nurse calls or when the physician calls or sends a report over securely and says, you know what? what you're experiencing is most likely not related to um, you know, obsessive compulsive disorder. What you're seeing is Lyme's disease. And this is a neuro neurological issue. And so we're gonna refer them to a neurologist. And here are some of the interventions that you can help with. So we can make some quick assumptions based on these symptomatology um, you know, kind of measures and, and instruments, but we need to then collaborate with other disciplines and make sure that they're, um, you know, in the person's welfare and interest, that we're not stepping outside of our own scope of practice, but that they're also culturally appropriate, that not every person, not every, you know, intervention is going to be right just because a book says, um, this is the best thing. Now, I, I'll, be, I'll be downright honest with you. I was trained by uh, Dr. Cortland Lee for both my master's and my doc studies. Um, and I have had the opportunity to engage with folks and, and really become familiar in evidence-based practices and then wow. recognize that for some people, they don't fit 
they're not the right size. And, and I'm going to identify myself, I'll be very honest to say, I'm a humanist, I'm a humanistic existentialist. And so that is one of the bases, but it allows me also to bring in a multicultural social justice advocacy framework, because I want to make sure that ethically, we're doing those things to make sure that um, somebody's really getting the best care that they can. The challenge is, Ken, it takes time. It is a lot of work to pull this off. A lot of work because we're doing it online or a lot of work because we are doing it because we're counselors? It's a lot of work because we're doing it as counselors. And, and that's, remember, we also ethically need to be monitoring the effectiveness of treatment. And this is part of my, one of my research areas where, uh, you know, looking around is like I ask practitioners, well, how do you check, how do you monitor the effectiveness of treatment? And most everybody, I would say 95% responses were, um, I simply ask, is this helping? And what we know is that is not a, um, a really robust way to, to get that information, to check about the alliance, and then to see if those interventions are, are actually helping. They just, you know, somebody may be saying this is helpful when actually they're tanking. They're, they're, maybe they're experiencing non-suicidal self-injury okay. um, and they're not disclosing that to us. So I think it's challenging as counselors, but it's also perhaps at times it requires a little more technology and work because we're doing it virtually or using technology. So when you think about what we're doing virtually and you look at licensure laws and you look at uh, ethical practice and you look at uh, lack of education, lack of awareness, um, lack of opportunity to do this, where, like you said, during a pandemic, this is coming into view for a lot of people who have never ever thought about counseling in this manner, uh, who went kicking and screaming into technology in the first place. So what are some of the things, what are some of the things from your perspective that counselors can do to kind of bring themselves up to speed on how to best kind of navigate these new horizons that we're a part of? Good question. I, I think constantly being curious and critically curious, um, you know, not just taking the first information that comes across the website uh, on, a, on a web search, but being critically engaged in your curiosity and learning as a practitioner right. and, um, you know, engaging in those trainings, um, uh, reading articles and literature on where uh, distance counseling or telehealth is going. I mean, I was trained 15 years ago in, in telehealth, and I look back at that manual and I'm like, wow, things have really changed. Well, that's because it, technology's changed, though, right? Technology so is was changed. it correct back then and, and for the time that it was in, or, or were we getting it terribly wrong at that point in time, too? I don't think it was we're getting it terribly wrong. I think that the um, the technology has changed and has become uh, better. Not everybody has access to it. So there, there's still that issue that we need yeah. to be attentive to. Um, but cool. also some of the stuff related to who might be appropriate and how do we go about some of these interventions right. um, are, are problematic. And the other piece I think, Ken, is Sometimes people, in order to, to pay the, the mortgage, if, if you're a counselor and, and you're running your own practice or that type of a thing, you've got to have a certain amount of, of clients available to provide services to. And so there's this, you know, there's this business side of things. And one of my fears is that we've looked at wellness uh, through ACA. One of my fears is that people are burning out because when you go from one telehealth session to the next to the next, it is a little different than actually having, it can be a little different than having somebody who's sitting in a waiting room or is then coming into your office. Speak to that. Um, what is that? In what ways do you see that as being different? And what, what ways do you take care of yourself in, 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 in regards to that? Yeah, I, I think physically there is 
a break that one experiences after a session and you, you know, you close the door, you get a couple of minutes, you get that glass of water and then you go greet somebody. I think the temptation can be for um, folks to go from one Zoom session or, you know, I'm, I'm using Zoom as a, <laughs> it's a, it's an acronym, I guess, but one, one telehealth visit to the next, to the next, to the next. And what happens I think is that without actually scheduling in and being aware, self-aware and saying, wait a minute, I have to do things that are going to take care of myself in this process. Right. And if you're in an agency setting, I don't know that, you know, that's advocacy from a supervisor's level. Mm -hmm. um, that's really the intervention to say, wait a minute, we have got to um, measure this out in such a way that folks are gonna be able to get that break and, and slow down. So I, I was going to ask you a little bit about accountability, not just um, from a supervisor's point of view in this case where you just spoke to, but accountability in general. You know, in some regards, it seems safer to go into a location and, and receive counseling services. There's a little bit of an unknown when you're online, right? So how do we hold counselors accountable for doing the right thing and not causing harm to their to their clients? It's a good question. I think that it is about um, consultation groups and um, supervision. You know, I, I think that one of the challenges is a lot of times after uh, an individual becomes licensed, it's like, <laughs> I, I've, I've arrived, you know, look, look I've, I'm finally licensed. I have finished the master's degree. I've gone through, uh, you know, all of these different steps. And, um, you know, let's face it, getting licensed is not an easy process. Uh, and it takes a lot of, it takes a lot of work. And I think it's challenging for a new professional who finishes up and goes, okay, now it's like, I got to do another master's degree. To so I'm trying to read through the lines what you're talking about. Are you saying that when they get their license or they are licensed uh, at that particular point in time, then maybe the imposter syndrome goes away and they feel like they're, um, you know, they do all things. Is that kind of where you're going with that? Well, no, what I think where I'm going is, is that there is this sense of, oh my gosh, I don't need to really consult into work. The imposter syndrome may go away, but I think it's more about the, the, the sense of, I don't need to check in with somebody who's going to be a supervisor uh, or some folks may call it a master practitioner, clinician, uh, a consultant to, to have those ways to check in and get feedback because I may actually have a blind spot. So do and, you feel that most counselor education programs lead um, new counselors to that kind of an end? Because, I, I mean, do you think that there's some kind of conversation in the teaching or in the programs, curriculums that we, that we have that help people understand that there's a need for added consultation and supervision throughout the lifespan of a counselor? I, I, I hope so. I, you know, some of my experiences in teaching have included uh, that, and I, I see some programs, but I can't speak universally. My hope is that, yes. Um, but but I would say that you know uh, it's uh, gonna gonna get a little little over the top with the cognitive bias uh, typed codex. But uh, one of the things is called the Dunning Kruger effect, and it, what it means is that at any point in our professional lifespan, we're going to have gaps in knowledge and then make assumptions about others, uh, even at the same point or at other points. And so we need to constantly have. Uh, feedback from other practitioners who can right. help us engage in good practice. Right. And that's what I think I love about the multicultural social justice counseling competencies and that it's about becoming a lifelong learner, understanding that things are going to always uh, have an impact on not just ourselves, but on our clients and that we need to be aware, self-aware yes. enough to be able to do that. And so when you think about it from the perspective of someone coming in and saying, okay, I, I have arrived, I am what, you know, when you look at some of these racial identity models, you say someone who has kind of 
kind of self-actualized, right? And has come to this particular point. But in a very real sense, we should never get there, right? It should always be an aspirational goal that we should always be lifelong learners as we are moving forward. Exactly. I, I would frame it as I'm arriving. And so it's always a, an ing, it's a gerund. It's I'm arriving, I'm becoming, I am continuing to grow and to learn. And for me, um, it kind of a, a quick sidebar. I had the chance years ago when I was in my master's of theology program, I, I got to meet uh, Dr. Jerry May, uh, who was the younger half sibling of Rollo May, the American existentialist. And Jerry focused on the stuff of will, willingness, the openness, the willingness to understand, the willingness to be understood, uh, as opposed to being willful and saying, you know, this is the way it's got to be. And, and I, I, that moved me so much in my early career to, to have that encounter and to be uh, really just to, to experience it and the, the sense of genuineness. Um, to, to be willing to, to say, gosh, I have got to learn more about this. Trained 15 years ago, gosh, the research has changed, the models have changed, the technology has changed, but the need is still present and, and, and more so. So how is it that we can move it forward? Wow, well, that looks like a great spot for us to take a break real quick and um, come back and talk with you some more about what telemental health is and, and what us as counselors, especially American Counseling Associations affiliated counselors can be doing to move the needle on, on what we're doing as, as counselors for our clients. And so I'm Dr. S. Ken Butler, and this is the Voice of Counseling uh, from the American Counseling Association. Our conversation continues in a moment. Counselors help positively impact lives by providing support wellness, treatment. We're working to change lives. We are creating a world where every person has access to the quality, professional counseling, and mental health services needed to thrive. So welcome back. I'm Dr. S. Kent Butler, and we're continuing our conversation with Dr. John Dugan. And so, it is phenomenal that we've gotten to this point. We talked a little bit about telemental health and, and how it has really impacted our lives here during this pandemic. Can you give us some recommendations? Uh, what do counselors need to start looking into those who have not necessarily navigated this pathway yet? What are some things that you would share with them that will help them in their journey? Sure. Um, first one I have, Kent, is just because you can doesn't mean you, you should. should. <laughs> now, okay. I, I understand that we are in a global healthcare pandemic. And the need, the, I mean, the script has been flipped, the table has been turned, we need to come up with new and creative ways to be helpful. But I also want to give the just because you can doesn't mean you should. What does that mean? In clinical practice, just because I'm working with a student at, uh, let's say, the University of Maryland, just down the road from me. Maybe they're, you know, starting bipolar medications or, or something for a seizure disorder or something like that. They're local, they're close. I know the resources. I'm licensed in Maryland. It's, this, it's 20 minutes away, if that. I, I'm able to provide ethical and appropriate services within my scope of practice. I'm licensed to do that, collaborate with their caregivers. Now, let's imagine that that same student chooses to move to the Eastern Shore or Western Maryland. I know nothing about that community. I don't know the physicians. I don't know the practitioners there. They're starting a whole new school program. There could be a lot more psychosocial stressors and environmental issues. Just because I can work with them, I'm licensed to, doesn't necessarily mean I should. Right. Maybe, maybe there's the need to actually transfer the care or to get greater supportive services right. from somebody who's in the local community. Which goes back to what we talked about earlier, where the reason why you need supervision and consultation with the others so that, because a lot of times I would think that 
you don't want to give up that practice uh, or that client because it means something to you in terms of maybe your your cash flow, the money that you're getting from having that as a person as a client. And also just a lot of times people just don't want to give up on someone that they've been working with. So how do you get through those types of things and how do you move forward in that regards? Consul- consultation, working with others, being honest. I mean, one of the, 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 the foundations of our code of ethics is veracity. We've got to be truthful. We've got to speak truthfully, um, you know, appropriately to one another and be truthful with our clients and, and all the others whom we may serve, our students. So you have but to be, we've got to be person... truthful. We've got to be truthful in, you know what, maybe it's not about me. Maybe I need to step back and say, I need to be able to make sure that this client gets the best type of care that they can. So that also means that the person has to really go through their program and the remaining of their career, being able to take critical feedback and listening and understanding and having some discernment when it comes to how they move forward with each and every client that they have. And, you know, a lot of times people think that they can, like you just said, and don't really have the skill set to do so. And then what that does is cause really maybe irrevocable harm to to a client. Absolutely. And, and you know, there, there can be times where it's not the right skill set. Uh, and, and I can go and, and seek, you know, more supervision and training and, and move into it. And there may be other times where the interventions aren't being helpful and maybe actually, you know, hanging on and saying this, this is the client that I've worked with for, for five or 10 years. And so therefore I'm going to continue it because we've always had this wonderful relationship. Well, part of the counseling experience, if I want to borrow some stuff from Dr. Irv Yalom is being able to engage in a transition, being able to say uh, in a healthy, good way, goodbye. So you said something uh, that you said something that was really interesting just now. You said yeah. sometimes you've been with a client for five plus years. Uh, is there a, it's a time limit? Is there a time when you maybe feel as though I mean, I understand that there's maintenance, right? And it's where somebody's coming and they're just staying with you so they they can maintain and things along those lines. But is there a certain point in time when you're working with a client, whether it's telementally or whether it's um, you know, in person where you have to say, you know what, maybe I've reached my breaking point with what I can do with this particular client. Perhaps I need to either refer them on to someone else, or maybe the person is, is needing to really step away from counseling experiences for a while so they can see what life is like for them on the other side of that. Absolutely. And that's where consultation and uh, we're kind of moving for the telehealth, but it's where con- consultation and monitoring the effectiveness of treatment come together. Mm-hmm. And I view it, Kent, as part of informed consent. I'm always already bringing that back in. Mm. How are things going? What is our relationship looking like? How are you experiencing this beyond these 45 minutes that we have uh, that insurance maybe, you know, if somebody's working with managed care, these 45 minutes that we have to work on something, maybe it's 60 minutes. What is life like after we move apart? What does it look like when we take breaks? And I I just want to clarify that when I say five years or longer, I'm talking about um, Usually, the, and I was a specialist in working with dissociative identity disorder. Right, right. Those, those are kind of a complex experience where folks maybe are coming for two times a week, three times a week, and it may be over the course of many years. And then they transition from one specialist to another and right. you know, also checking in with neurology and stuff Understood. like that. Understood. So um, when you think about uh, the, the work that we're doing as counselors, especially when we are kind of looking at somebody on the screen, right? Are there ways that you would want counselors to kind of position themselves or position their, their clients so that they can, you know, when you're in the room with a client, you can see their full body and you can see what they're doing and you can pay attention to maybe some things that maybe seem a little out of, out of order. Um, with regards to that, 
Is there something in your mind that we can do as counselors when we're looking at them on the screen? Um, would it be wise to watch them from a full body experience or is that just too far away? It, it, it could be. I, I think for me, the most important thing is remembering I'm talking to a human being. Okay. I'm not talking to, you see my humanism coming through here. It's, I, I'm not talking to a screen. This is a living, breathing, loving human being. What can I do if we're going to focus on our code of ethics to promote their wellness and dignity? And, and so that, you know, that is, I mean, if you have to put that up on a sticky note on your screen to remind you that, you know, by the way, this is not just another meeting. It is, these are a group of people who have thoughts and feelings and they're coming to you for a reason, right. then do it. Do so, what you need but, to do to remind yourself. But again, so I get that. But also, like I said, there are some things that, like, so when I'm working with a client and I watch them twitching and I see them having um, some things that are going on when we talk about a certain subject and I can visually see that, are there some cues that we should be on the lookout for on the screen when we're just seeing somebody who is, you know, head and shoulders? Well, y yes, you, 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 I mean, you, we're certainly going to become more cognizant or more aware of, you know, twitches or body movements or behavior, but also it's important to check in um, as appropriate. We don't want to make, I don't want to make somebody feel like they're under a microscope. You know, it's like a, one client used to say, I really enjoy being with you because I don't feel like the client, you know, the counselor or the practitioner has the high beams on me. They're, they're constantly scrutinizing everything. Right. But I think that, yes, we can check so what in. What might that look like? What, what kind of questions might we ask to check in with someone? Well, how, you know, how's it, how's it look like? I've noticed that, you know, one of the things that I may do is I may have a certain uh, move or the way that, is everything okay? You know, what, talk to me about what's going on. But even before I would do those typical things that we would outline in our skills class, right. I want to make sure that I have training and understand what it's like to be in the client's home environment, mm. which is different from having them show up in our professional practice. We need to be, it's, it's, so there are a whole other issue, set of issues that'll, that'll come into play. I mean, I used to do home visits. And so, uh, the, you know, the program that I uh, oversaw for a county was uh, one where we actually went into the home setting. You, you've got to have a sense of that. You've got to have a sense of the cultural and the family experience. Um, and also, if we're working with technology, you need to make sure that somebody is actually uh, in a secure, safe environment. Right. Do you have a way to check that this is somebody, there's a code word so that somebody can say to you, I'm safe or I'm actually in harm's way. Exactly, exactly. I like that. And so there's so many different things. So many questions are coming up for me and I maybe gonna, I'm gonna pop some questions at you and maybe you can come back with some quick responses. Uh, you work with somebody who has weak techno, technological skills. Um, the internet goes out while you're in the middle of session. What do you do? Have a, have a backup plan. Always have a backup plan. I, I always make sure that I've got somebody's phone number or some other way to kind of follow up, if at all possible. Okay. If there is a, a weather outage or something like that, I want to have a contingency plan. Um, you know, they can text me or something. I usually will not do text because it's not safe and secure, but I want to know that somebody's okay and that we'll have a, a way to check back in. Right. So a counselor is working with somebody and there are people in the background and maybe not a person with a headphones. What, 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 what's your first response to your client? My, my, so this is one of the things is you always want to check the background, right? So what I'll do is I will show where I am and my, I'm not moving my camera now, but my office space or wherever I'm usually wearing earbuds and I will let them know that I am. And I want them to do the same thing. I want to know, tell me, where are you? If there are other people in the background, let's, tell me what you can do to go to a, a private safe space. And if that means that you've got to sit on the edge of the bathtub, then you know what? I want for you to have a quiet, safe space for a little bit where you can actually uh, talk to me. 
and we can have a sense of privacy and confidentiality. So they insist that they're okay where they are. What do you do? Um, usually there, again, it's gonna depend on cultural uh, and geographical factors. There may be some areas where it's culturally and geographically uh, considered appropriate or that's all that they have. Mm -hmm. um, then you know what I'm going to do is ask them and make sure that I follow up in a uh, private, secure conversation. Is that really what is going to work for you, or do you feel as though you are um, being threatened or intimidated? Is your privacy being um, jeopardized, and is our ability to be effective lessened because you have other distractions or people around you? If the answer is yes, then I want to brainstorm with them on how it is that they can change the game up uh, and do it so it's confidential and securely. So when your client doesn't come online when you're when they're supposed to, um, in terms of the timing that you have set up, um, what are some of the things or approaches that counselors can do to ensure that everything's either okay or that the person's not just missing their appointment, right? Um, and sometimes it could be over multiple weeks or multiple times that they're supposed to get together. How do you account for someone who is kind of being tardy and or maybe not necessarily um, um, showing up for their sessions? Yeah, um, that, that's in your informed consent. You really need to have a communications plan and a backup plan. And that's informed consent is not a one-time process where you just you do a form, you sign off on it, and away it goes into an electronic chart or a filing cabinet. You, no, you continually talk about it. And if somebody has, uh, you know, a missed session or something like that, um, I'm calling them up, or I'm, I'm probably going to send them. I'll have a, a secure portal uh, rather than an email, which can, uh, you know be hacked and things like that. So I'm going to try to reach out to them on that. Uh, if, if in the informed consent and the communications policy, I have something that talks about, um, you know, the uh, innocuous texts. So, you know, if like you're waiting at the door or if something has happened and you're, you know, some sort of happenstance has come along and it's not personal information. All I want is an initial and so I, I just know who's sending this text because I'm not keeping your phone number in my phone. And what I may do is just say, in those instances, I may reach out to you by text and say, is everything okay? But I have to keep in mind that the individual that I am, that is my client, may not be responding to that text, especially if you work with folks who have interpersonal violence. Um, you have to take all of these other variables into consideration. Right. I'm definitely reaching out on them. Two weeks? Mm -mm. No, I, I want to find out what's going on. I want to have a conversation. Before about you terminate a, a client. Oh, you know, oh, oh, yeah. You would oh, just yeah. find uh -huh. out that there's something that's going on in terms of that. Okay, oh, yeah. so how do you help someone who's doing telemental health and billing and, and insurance things? Is there any feedback or recommendations for those who are now venturing into telehealth and need to kind of look at how they are compensated for their for the services. Sure. Uh, you want to make sure that you are billing. Uh, so, so tracking those claims, uh, usually if you're using telehealth services, you're going to be engaging with um, some sort of a, a vendor that uh, hopefully is engaging with, you know, secure and encrypted practices. Uh, you want to make sure that you your billing is clean, so they call it a clean claim, uh, that you're submitting them regularly. So, you know, this is not the area to procrastinate where, you know, it's like, gee, I think I want to wait to write this next uh, chapter or something. No, 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 no. You've got you've to get these claims out regularly, got to have a system in place, uh, and then you want to check the electronic remittance. If someone has two insurance plans and they're doing telehealth, and one is primary and one is secondary, you've got to do verifications and check all of that on the front end. Mm. So you've got to make those phone calls or have somebody who is um, a business associate agreement is what we call, so a business associate. And you've got to remember that if you're submitting these claims and you're using types of technology to transmit this information, Congratulations, you are a part of the HIPAA club and there is no way to talk your way out of this. It's So um, one other question, there yeah. is uh, licensure and um, 
and legislative actions that are in play, uh, especially when it comes to telemental health. Right. Are there any things that you would suggest to counselors that they can do to strengthen um, the resolve of counselors in the eyes of licensure boards when it comes to telemental health and to legislators, especially when we think about the interstate compact and, and the fact that people are going to be counseling across borders? Reach out, advocate, go to licensure board meetings if you can, or join them virtually. Uh, remember that the board is actually the professional members when they gather and they, you know, the gavel drops and they have their meeting. Uh, it's not the regulators. The regulators are the ones who take what the board is deciding or through the Department of Health and then enacting it. I would say if for those that are doing advocacy um, and, and maybe they're using a temporary license uh, in another state because of the pandemic, the governor may rescind that. And so if that's the case, you need to be checking. We all need to be checking board websites. Um, I have my students doing it every 60 days because regulations can change and it is not a defense ethically. I'm not a lawyer, so I can't speak legally, but it's not simply not a defense to say, gosh, I didn't know. And the other thing, Ken, I would add is do not change the name of the game. So if you've been doing professional counseling with somebody and all of, you know, it's in a different jurisdiction, um, and you're, you're doing something to kind of help them out and you're working on a temporary license and then the governor rescinds that. Don't change the name and simply say, oh, we're doing professional coaching now. It is most likely it is not going to fly. It's going to get you into hot water. Yeah. So, so, you know, stay truthful, stay honest about it and do what needs to be done. Do yeah. the good work and do it well. Stay true to who you are and your professional identity. So that yes. sounds like a phenomenal place to end our conversation today. John, thank you so much. Uh, it's been great talking with you, especially when we have to expand our horizons about what we're thinking about and talking about when it comes to telemental health. And I think you've provided us with great ideas and great opportunities to move and explore how we can even make our profession that much even better. Um, so Appreciate you. Thank you for taking time out today to be a part of the podcast. This is the voice of counseling um, coming from the American Counselors Association. Dr. S. Kent Butler telling you to have a great day and enjoy the view. Enjoy all those things that are going on in the world. And we'll be back with another episode next week. Thank you. Have a great day. ACA provides these podcasts solely for informational and educational purposes. Opinions expressed in these podcasts do not necessarily reflect the view of ACA. ACA is not responsible for the consequences of any decisions or actions taken in reliance upon or as a result of the information and resources provided in this program. This program is copyright 2021 by the American Counseling Association. All rights reserved.